coming out of the uh, the back entrance because I wasn't allowed to leave from the front entrance oh, ever. Oh, God. I had to come out the back entrance and it was all druggies just behind that building uh, on a, on this estate in New Cross and you could get all out there. Oh, New Cross was a beast back yeah. there as well, boy. And, um, but I had my studio equipment there, so I just used to sit there and... You know, I set my equipment up and I was still recording, mm -hmm. you know, so I was able to record, but I, I couldn't live, you know. And I remember waking up in the mornings because I wasn't allowed any blankets or anything. So my jacket... Because it couldn't look like you lived no. there. No. So I used to sleep on the floor. I used to sleep on the floor. Um, and I used to wake up in the morning sometimes with mice and rats running over oh, me. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> fuck that. Darling, you tell me that has happened to you, that doesn't. Um, Shit. You know, the killer killer podcast. Killer killer official .com. <laughs> You need the television app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the app store for free today. Yo, NolanPolandRecords.com for underground classics. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Did you say that? Killer Cow and Hot that's the motif to begin with. <laughs> Yo, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast, live and direct, central London, central as you need to be, could be, wanna be, should be. We ain't anywhere else with central London. Um, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk, uh, strainstation.co.uk, Nolan Poland, hold tight. That's it, it's hot out there, we're getting it hotter right and in here. Um, Kellervision, the app, free download, iPhone, Android, fully street culture, sports. Where to begin? It's actually 5.21, no bullshit. The time is right, the time is now. <laughs> and we are in the house with a legend, a hero of mine, a friend of a long time, uh, and not to mention a man that survived as the hardest working um, with an inner line that goes from strength to strength. An OG original from beatboxer to MC to now host of the channel 521. If you don't know about this MC, get to know this MC. Blade MC inside the place. How you doing, bro? <laughs> oh, how was that for an intro? Oh, that was, that, was, um, that was an epic intro. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was epic. Uh. It's hard to put it into context, into, into one timeline of a sentence, so the, the levels in which you've uh, orbited England <laughs> and the world, man. Yeah, I'm telling you, but... You know what? I'm I'm amazed you memorize all of that because when I do my thing, it's like I'm I'm there going like literally two words in and it's all a scramble for the next word. I'm just here foraging what best I can describe of a timeline of you. Because here's the thing. I knew there was blade before I was into hip hop. And for a lot of these people, especially the younger guys that check out the show, without question, a lot of their heroes. You know, they, it stems from the buck kind of stops with my guy right here, along with a handful of yeah. OGs of its time, right? Yeah, of course, man. I mean, obviously, you can't go anywhere without mentioning your hijacks and your gunshots and your mm. Cash 22s and your London Fosses mm. and your MC Mellow. Demon and, Boys. Yeah, Demon you know. Boys. Uh, you know, there, there's so much. There's mm. so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, hard Noise as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, the list is endless, isn't yeah. it? But we say it's endless, but there was about... 10 or 15 groups that really cemented that thing. Uh, Do you, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, people, that, 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 yeah, the that, that real uh, figureheads. Yeah. Does Britain have a thing for that? Because I remember when Scratch Perverts was a thing, no one else could be a, a team DJ. So it's like the mental, and a killer killer, there's only one. But there was loads of other people that were around at the time. But, but, but the British public, they champion one and almost like pigeonhole it in like, that's the identity of that one specific genre mm -hmm. or sound or stuff. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's interesting you mentioned that because I was having this conversation with someone literally the, earlier this week and we were talking about um, the DJ crews that were about at the mm -hmm. time. So you had your Invisible Scratch Pickles, um, then you had Scratch Perverts, you had the Enforcers and do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Whoever else was there. So, yeah, I, I think it wasn't just one. Mm -hmm. There was a small group. Like, if you imagine it as a... If you imagine it as a as a pool table mm. or a snooker table with pockets, mm. everything had their little pockets in it. Dude, that's so. such a great analogy. It's true, and everyone's shooting. Everyone's, yeah, everyone's shooting. shooting. Everyone's shooting. No one's getting it in though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you feel that coming up in the beginning? Was there a resistance to Blade the artist? 
Oh, mate, like, I'm not even going to lie. I look in that camera and say it straight. Uh, straight. I, I, I always felt there was always some kind of resistance. Really? Because I didn't follow the normal route. You know, just, just as we were walking up here, mm. I made a call to a friend of mine who uh, basically I'll, will remain nameless, but he was managing me when he was 15 and I was 17, something along those lines. Mm. And, um, you know, it's like he kept telling me that I needed to change the way I approach things because people don't understand what goes on in my head. And I'm like, well, you know what? If they don't understand, I'll find people who do. Mm. And, but there was always resistance of some sort. It's, I think when, when you're an artist and you have in your mind what you want to achieve, mm. I, I think it's impossible to not have resistance. Because that's what makes the energy that makes that's you want to exactly move, propels you forward. Exactly. And and it might and it might not be a case of like people latch onto it straight away, but it, it just it's like stuff that goes viral. Mm. Yeah, it's like it just takes that one unique thing and it goes off. That's kind of the model now, isn't it? Finding Always. that viral moment that propels what you're doing. Yeah, but it, although a lot of people fake it. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, come on, like I see so many videos where people like do silly things, like. Mm. I don't know, it looks like they've hired police uniforms and they're pretending a policeman is arresting them because they've got a bar of soap in their car. Yeah, that's, that's so TikTok, though. That's uh, it's, like... so, yeah, it's so bollocks. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, do you frequent with any of... Because I like this idea of, like, in, in, in my, in my hip-hop head of mine, my British hip-hop head, at least, that all you guys are... You, you, you're calling each other on the hustle all the time. Like, I can imagine Sun and Noise, Cool Rock calling you up about some shit, or, I don't know, Renegade just hitting you up. I don't know, you know, it's just these sorts of... This, 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 this community mm -hmm. of, of an era that's still relevant now in the UK hip-hop world, mm -hmm. you guys are just, like, speed dialing all the time. <laughs> No, you know what? It's funny you say uh, about the speed dialing because there was a time where things were a little bit like that mm. and it wasn't always with uh, the people that you mentioned. Mm. So, like, obviously, Renegade was my DJ at one point, so we used to talk quite often. Mm. Um, you know, Gunshot was a group from East London, so we didn't really communicate, mm. you know, plus their manager um, had his vision of what they had to do and where, where they had to go, who they mingled with and all mm. that. Um, it wasn't even it wasn't even that it was just people kind of had their little route that they took. However, there were certain people that I was in contact with all the time. Like at one point, I used to be talking to MCM from Caveman. Yo, um, on and a that ain't, uh, that's some real. He's what another huge influence for me, bro. Yeah, he's sick, and that's that's a whole name nine yards and then some album. And and, uh, and and that's a name that we should have mentioned a couple minutes ago, amongst all the others. Yeah, yeah, because you know, he's so definitely Elsbury man, up. isn't he? An yeah, man? yeah. Well. Um, is it Ellsbury or is it um, High Wickham? Uh, High Wickham. High Wickham. Blew the doors, man. Like, I remember yeah. hearing him kiss and stuff. I was like, yo, like, that guy yeah. never relax a hard track. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. hard, isn't it? How hard is But there was this, um, there was this um, Brickcore movement. Now, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, to, to, to the untrained, that's, that's, it, it's kind of niche to describe it, but the truth was it gave an identity to... The British sound and it resonated. Rhyme syndicate suddenly like with ears pricked up. The Bomb Squad had a lot to play in the influencing of that, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think the sound was already beginning to shape up. And then when Bomb Squad came in, it's like it clicked. Mm. You know, like, I mean, I, I regularly get compared to Chuck D for the way I, I used to deliver my vocals. Mm. I, I don't see it personally, but if people see that... I think I mean? it's the uniqueness of your voice. I saw this documentary on, on on Chuck D and a lot of people of its time, they weren't favourable to his voice because it was so new. Your vocal, I mean, it, yeah, I think a lot of it is because it's so cutting through and identifiable. Guru is another one, I think. Yeah, That's a very identifiable voice. 100%. Yeah. yeah, Guru. <laughs> flowers, flowers, blade. Come on, son. Yo. Uh, but yeah, rest in peace, Guru, obviously. Uh, amazing. Yeah, like, and he was so calm and smooth with it. But it's it's weird. It's like, you know, we we were all into like this rugged, um, like even even if you were telling your girlfriend you loved her in a track, it was still like you wanted to kill her. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There was still these air raid sirens. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I really do. <laughs> you know, here we go. You know what I mean? But, you know, this was this really set precedence. And I, you know, even when we were just joking there, yo, think of all the genres that have come. Like, like garage and and even grime now, drum and bass, like they gotta hold a hat to fucking hijacking you and people like that. 
For real? Yeah, I, I mean, hijack, 100%. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that people like me kind of would have influenced right, gun, the gunshot, scene. Though, gunshot, for sure. Gun, gunshot, um, you know, but I think, I mean, we influenced things, but I don't know if we, we influenced the sort of, sort of the garage scene. I think maybe um, drum and bass and, you know, jungle and all that kind of stuff, mm. you know, because there was people there, you have to remember there was people there that were into hip hop that then slowly moved away from hip hop and into those things. But it was the people that were fans that became producers mm. and they were DJs and they became producers and they started creating the sound, you know? So then you had your junglist and whatever, but they were all into hip hop. And then, and then you obviously had people like the Prodigy. Oh my God. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And big up DJ Fingers as well, because like, yeah. they, they pretty much like ripped the fuck out of that, yeah. didn't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, this is this is what I'm saying. It's like everything in one way or another, even if there's an artist that you're listening to that you don't rate, you'll probably pick up something from that that will influence you to do something. Do you think hip-hop for its time in the UK, because it sounds fun, but I don't think there was the commodity for everyone to get involved because there was this stigma, wasn't there, being from the UK? And I think that still holds true to a, to, to a smaller degree now, although we have all these amazing new genres that have sprouted that give our own identity the brick core definitely had that thing but again it goes back to that british mentality of like there can only be certain gatekeepers that represent that and perhaps that is why people transferred to other genres it was almost like a holding pen hip-hop and then it went to monetizing elsewhere yeah uh i mean let's let's be real it's it's the same for radio mm -hmm. it's the same for magazines it's like all right, let's, let's look at, say, for example, Dizzy Rascal. Um, I think Dizzy Rascal's wicked. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. from the day that he popped into the scene, I was just like, wow, oh, who's this guy? Smashed it. You know, smashed it. Um, and I've been watching him all these years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, probably missed a few bits here and there when I was mad busy, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, I got to see a lot of stuff. But when Dizzy was there, it's almost like no one else was allowed in. Do you know what I mean? Totally and and the, and the industry. Let's let's be real about the industry. The industry is racist. Yeah, yeah. It has been for yeah. ever since the beginning. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was having this conversation on one of my interviews with AJ from Hard Noise, mm. and we were talking about record covers mm. and how um, in the fifties, like if a black artist had made a record, right, you would see a photograph of a few white women yeah, yeah. sitting on a beach. Yeah, or they would have them re-recorded by a white singer. Yeah, like that. yeah, you know, and that's never stopped. That I think that still carries on. But now yeah. it's become big business for the record labels to play that card mm. and to make it seem like they're supporting yeah, the young yeah, yeah, yeah. black artists and whatever. But, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of the dealings, but it makes me wonder if they're just using them and then... It's like, mm. it's a commodity. Just have it now, throw it away. Don't give a shit about you. Fuck yeah. off. Move on to yeah, the next yeah, one. Yeah. Binge and purge the culture. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. I'm always challenged by that. Especially, especially with social media because it's, all the history, like, fault lines have been severed. It's now about the social platform. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you have to, I mean, for me, I always wonder how much truth there is in what we see on socials anyway. Mm. You know, like... Even like someone said to me the other day, numbers don't lie. Yeah. We're in a time where numbers are the biggest liars Lies ever. ever. You know, it's like, I know, I know people that basically are telling me behind closed doors when I'm asking them, how are you getting like 50,000 views when you put your video up 10 hours ago? And, and, <laughs> and you've got four comments, sorry, four likes and two comments. Mm. And the comments, your sister and your girlfriend. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So how are you getting that? Great work, babes. Yeah, shit like so, that. So show me those numbers and tell me you're not lying. And and actually, while we're on the subject here, we're talking to the gentleman and and again, just hats off. And again, I'm sure it's not been it's been done before, but to this level where you were pretty much numbers in action. You were selling your vinyl, tapes and CDs, hand to mouth on the streets and he can clarify that you sold significant units to put you in a chart position based off of the fact you were selling it by hand these ain't no lying numbers you know <laughs> yeah no i, I mean look uh, you know I, when when we did the earlier records um every time we put a record out 
I mean, I guess for people who don't know the ins and outs of the industry, in particular the people that, let's, let's remember, back then we had a lot of fans and not too many artists. Mm -hmm. So that changed, and that's part of the problem with the scene now. There's, everyone's a rapper. Mm. You know, everyone's a beatboxer, everyone's mm. a DJ, everyone's mm. a producer. Mm. You know what I mean? And if you're not, then, you know what I mean? You're mm. going to start tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it's, you see it and you see it and you become it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and when, when we used to sell records in the early days, we sold good numbers. But what people don't understand is we were selling good numbers at very low rates. So it was costing me, say, one pound oh. eighty. Well, it was costing me one pound eighty mm. um, plus VAT to manufacture the records. Then we had travel expenses for me and a couple of people that would come, but we jumped the trains most of the time. Mm. Let's be real. Mm. But then I was feeding them and all kinds of stuff, um, not all the time because I couldn't always afford it. And any money that we made went back into the kitty to make the next record. Mm. So, you know, we could have sold like twenty thousand copies, but we weren't making money, bro. Mm. Right, it's like You're feeding the machine. Feeding the machine, um, and and it was you know, when the first time I saw money was when I did the project on my own with the Lion album, mm. and all double of a sudden, double vinyl, wasn't it? It was yeah, fucking yeah. crazy black and white, and you listed everybody that bought it prepaid. Uh, not everybody, and I'll, I'll explain why because this is like um, so explain the story with the with the inlay there because that's, that's okay. an important factor. All right, so basically what happened is. Um, I didn't have money to hit the studio because in between money coming in from other records, we had bills to pay to keep the thing going. Mm. Like, you know, we had to go and record things and, and studio wasn't cheap. Mm. We didn't have the equipment in our house and we couldn't record on an iPhone. And mm. do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We had to go studios, pay an engineer mm. and have a specific time. If it goes wrong, you got to book it again and go through the whole process again. Yeah. So it wasn't easy. Um, but with regards the the booklet, I needed the money up front in order to be, I needed the money in order to be able to um, get the album finished. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there one day and I was I was talking to someone and and they were talking to me about um, I think it was Mick Jagger and how they when they started they used to send out their records and by this time I'm already doing the independent thing anyway, but. He said something in the conversation where they were like, they sent the records out and if people didn't like the record, right, they didn't have to pay. They just had to give it to someone else that would pay. And I just thought, you know what? I know what I'm going to do. Mm. So I went, I went home and I sat down. Darkness. I, I, I used to think a lot in darkness. Um, um, I, didn't, I didn't have money to pay electric bills and stuff. So Straight candles, lot, baby. Uh, straight candles. Straight candles. Uh, you know, and that's the reason why in, in my reflection track I've got a candle mm. and I'm in a dark room mm. on the cover. And the silhouette of the Blade logo. Yeah. All of that shit. Um, all of that. Um, but yeah, so I, I, sat, I sat down and thought, how am I going to get money from people up front? I, I can't go to people um, and, and ask them for the money without giving them something back. Then I had a conversation with my press agent and I said... Angus, can you get me in all these magazines? Tell them I'll do an interview with them if at the end of the interviews they give a P.O. box address out and tell people to send the money there. Nice. And Angus goes, easy. I could do that, no problem. Wow. So he got me a whole bunch of interviews, 15, 20 interviews, whatever, with loads of different magazines. And on, on the end of the interview, tagging along was send your money for the album and you will get a free 70. Entrepreneurial shit. You know, so I have Angus to thank for that, for Pick making that Angus. happen. No. So if anyone doesn't know, Angus Beatty is a wicked, wicked journalist, a really good friend of mine, and he, he was on the journey with me. Old so he made, that, he made no, that stuff same happen. Same. Um, you know, but, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't really till the Lion album that money started coming in, but what was, what was amazing was I put the word out and I'm sitting there and the postman drops a message through the letterbox going, there's loads of posts for you at the P.O. box. Oh, and I'm thinking, oh, there's going to be like five things, mm -hmm. you know. I've gone there, and when I say, like, it was a stack of these many envelopes, and I'm taking them home, and I'm opening them up, and all through the week, I'm opening all these envelopes up, and I look through, and I'm like, bloody hell, 27 grand. What the fuck? It's like, oh, Yo, shit. That's and a P.O. box was, you want to be opening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, and it, and, the, and the mad thing was, because I'm counting, and, and people had sent, Checks in the post, people have sent PO, uh, postal orders. 
Uh, people had sent cash. Did any bounce? Did any bounce? None, not yeah, one. That's mad. And Disorder was one of the many characters, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big up that. Disorder, another legend. You know? Yeah. UK hustler. <laughs> yeah, 1,000%. One, 1, right? mm. That guy was on it, like, serious. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah, so I figured when, when I... I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was expecting maybe 20, 30 people to respond. Mm. And I thought, you know what? I can pay for one studio time. But when, when I got the response and there yeah. was... Because what happened is, you know, with regards the the names in the booklet, mm -hmm. at, the, at the back of the booklet, um, what that was is if you, if you count the numbers, there's nowhere near the numbers of people that sent money. Because what, what used to happen is, say, someone in Newcastle would go, Blade... Um, I could sell 45 copies for you. Okay. I've already got the list. And I'll just put his name down because yeah. I didn't have all the other names. So there was another 45 within that name. Yeah. Like a, and no, then, like a, like a tree. Like and a, like and the a, guy in Belgium had over 200 records on his own. A guy in Belgium ordered and he's just like, yeah, send me, send me like 200, 220 copies, 230 Like a family copies. tree, you know. And and they, the fault lines yeah. go on and you so, don't know who. And this, this is just two examples I'm, I'm yeah. pulling out. But there was other people who were ordering like 10 another one ordering like 20 30 and and mm. it, it just can't it, it was if i'm being honest i felt it was beautiful to watch it grow because I, I thought in all these years i've gone to people in positions who can help me with mm. studio time with with manufacturing with recording with and no one helps mm. yeah and then you get the average person on the street mm. that sees what you're trying to do mm. and they jump on board no questions asked and and you know what was what was even more risky for them, they could have sent me the money, and I could have run off with it. Because <laughs> people do that, yeah. like they, they but do that. Not one person can do that. And if you want to know an interesting story as well, um, so I got a message from one person in I think it was Glasgow or Edinburgh. I think it was Edinburgh actually, and he goes, "I got the record, but it's broken." I'm like, well, "What do you mean it's broken?" He goes, well, the postman folded it in mm. half to put it through the letterbox. What? I'm like, well, it says fragile. Dumb. So anyway, I said, you know what? I'll send you another one. So I sent another one. I told him to keep that one. Yeah, I just said, just hold it just in case I need it. Um, sent him another one. And he goes, bro, you're not going to believe it. It's happened again. So I've gone to the post office and I've said, look, you see this? I've sent the records mm. and the postman at the other end keeps folding it. It clearly says fragile. I've sent it through your people. Yeah. You've come to my house to collect everything. You see how it's all there. It's all got fragile stickers. Mm. Why is he folding the record in half? <clears throat> yeah? Mm. So now I've got two albums that have gone missing or not missing, damaged. Mm. I want my refund. And on top of that, I want the train fare to go to Edinburgh and deliver it myself. Hold on. Because I can't trust. I Did can't you go up there? I went to Edinburgh and delivered the record. I went to Edinburgh and delivered the record. By hand. That's the hardest story. That's no, the hardest sure. story. Do you think? Do you think these experiences that your core audience have of you with such stories as this? Because I know you for a long time, and I know that it's almost like the folklore of Blade. You know, shit. Just it, it, and we'll get into a little bit more of that later. But uh, do you think that's what garners like such a hardcore fan base? Like. You've got some diehard motherfuckers on your Facebook, and, and you know what I mean. Then that's an age demo in itself. You know, you can really tell that the, the the impact of a post, and you see people commenting, graphic like proper championing. You know, real core shit. Do you think that's what's garnered that? Yeah, of course, no question. Because um, I think what it is is when when I was doing what I was doing, um, people felt there was an integrity to it, yeah. and people either attached to the in integrity or they get scared by it. On a street level, people attach to it, mm. you know, because it's like it's it's almost like someone was their voice. Yeah, you know, like a spokesperson. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that wanted to do the same things and didn't know how, yeah. and you know, so everywhere I used to go, there was people always like coming to me at shows, going, "Bro, do you mind if I if I buy you a drink and we just mm. sit down and talk about mm. how do I manufacture records, how do I mm. this, how do I, do you mm. know what I mean?" Mm. So yeah, I, I think people just relate. You know, and, and in some ways I feel like social media has kind of taken all of that away. Kind because of. now um, because now everyone seems to think that you just go viral and you made it. I think there's a, dis uh, uh, yeah, there's a, there's, um, it, it certainly feels like people are disillusioned slightly. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, let's be, let's be real. This has been building for a long time. Mm. And, um, you know, when I talk about things like this, I feel like sometimes I can come across as negative. Mm. Yeah, but I just look at it like I'm just addressing what I'm seeing. 
it might not be what you're seeing, but when, when I'm doing the, the job I'm doing and mm. I'm talking to so many people and people are like, yeah, but nobody supports us, you mm. know? And all it takes is for you to say um, in an interview, uh, sorry, not in an interview, on a post that you're going to kidnap someone and bring them in for an interview <laughs> and laugh about it. <laughs> yeah. And you use the word kidnap and yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's basically bullying. Don't say no, some of <laughs> There goes the trailer. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, all the writers. But but then but that one word, but see yeah, that yeah, one yeah. word, my account yeah. got restricted yeah, yeah. for like ten days. But yeah. they said restricted for ten days. But if I put a post up now, I'm getting no views yeah, yeah, and no yeah, likes yeah. because they haven't restricted it for ten days. They've restricted it. I think also there's something about striking. It's like for instance, um, you know, when you, we're talking about graph on the podcast, you know, we go we would go up bombing and stuff like that. And um, you know, regularly, I think maybe. And I'm not saying suggesting it's entirely. I'm, I'm generalizing here that perhaps, like you know, when you get a strike on your on your page, they're then doubly watching. And then, like you said about even like with your phone, you know, we were talking before we were on a podcast, and you were saying about your phone and how it wasn't uploading because of the end, and you had to, ended up having to kind of you know negotiate and find the reasons why this wasn't this was yeah, happening. It took you months, know? months, it took yeah. months. You know, I asked so many people different things and whatever, but I I do feel like. Um, you know, there's some kind of a China rule going on here. You oh, know, yeah. like, you know, not I everyone's... I mean, I, I know people that have got 40, 50,000 followers. I know people that have got 120,000 followers. I got mm. a friend who's got 460,000 followers. Mm. Now, my friend who is getting 140,000, I've spoken to, person, uh, person to person, call and whatever. Um, he lives out in France. And, you know, he used to get like six, seven, eight thousand likes within the first couple of hours of putting a post up. No, that's up. disappeared, eh? 200 he's yeah, happy yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm noticing you know? this change, yeah. And, uh, and, it's, and, and it is some kind of a control thing. And they, they're basically obviously trying to make money. Mm. But, you know, how can you turn around and say it's a business and you're trying to make money and then you're telling us you've got 70 billion profits? Mm. <laughs> it, it makes no sense. I don't know what their profits are. But your, um, your legacy transcends... I think a lot of people will be curious to know how you first started. Was it New Cross where you were based? No, originally when I mean I went to boarding school. That's so I was in right. I was in Blackheath, and the journey actually started in Blackheath. Okay. I mean, there's there's so many different variations to how the journey began. Let's tell that. Let's let's break it down for those naysayers and the 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 the, the, the whisperers. Tell them where it really began for you. Okay, so I used to go to a boarding school called Christ College, which is on Blackheath. Mm. Um, when I was at Christ College, sorry, my eyes are burning. I got, I, I don't know if you can see this, but I got an issue with my eyes. So if you're not l l watching and you're so listening, he's, he's got himself <laughs> a bit of pink eyed hair, you know what I mean? <laughs> and no, it ain't from a happened. bare pillow, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know I don't how it happened, happened, did you? No, 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 but it's all good. But yeah, so I went to this boarding school and obviously, um, you know, many times we'll talk about, we used to go to Covent Garden and this and that and the other, but, at the, but really the school discos from sort of 81, 82, at the end of the discos, we were always there body popping or break dancing or whatever before we even knew what hip hop was because mm -hmm. hip hop really didn't gain its name till after Malcolm McLaren. That's what Arrow said as well. He was like, yo, you know, we used to go to Kent for these jams. Yeah. And that's what we're, where the rawness would be. It was yeah. not necessarily always... I mean, I mean look, um, Gary Bird and uh, uh, Experience. Yeah. Right? You know, uh, we wear the crown. Mm. You know, to me, that was just a guy talking on music. Mm. And obviously, it got the name rap, mm. you know, but there wasn't hip hop back then. It was no. just like, you know, then you had, obviously, you had um, Curtis Blow and people like that that were making records in the early 80s. Um, just the breaks. All these people that we're yeah. talking about now, you can look them up, Google that shit. Like, yeah. we're talking about, you know, legacy UK, old school hip hop here. Mm. And, and like I said, there wasn't the name hip hop attached to it. But what we what we were doing in our school, we were doing the body pop, and there was a couple of guys in the crew, um, and one of the guys was a guy called Michael Eberhorn, who used to go by the name of Flyboy, and Flyboy is the reason why I ended up going to Covent Garden because he used to hang out there, and he said you need to come. Oh shit! Like, out of all the kids that were in our school doing the body popping and all that, he was like, "You Flyboy was one. the Flyboy." He he was just like, "You need to be there. This is this is you. This is you all over." So were you beatboxing well, first? Was I was. I was um, I was body popping. I was breaking. I dabbled very lightly in graffiti, um, and I was predominantly beatboxing. But I was also rapping. But I kept the rapping quiet. 
um, only a few friends in school and stuff knew I was rapping. Mm. And they'll verify it. So any of my friends from school, if you were at Christ College and you used to see me rapping at the school discos and in the playground while I was dribbling the ball under mm. your weak mm. feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, holler, scholar, get involved. <laughs> Comment below, tell them what time it is. Give some more stories. <laughs> so you were beatboxing in the school premises. Yep. Yep. You, were, you Not necessarily Common Garden, but anywhere you could jump up and do it, Everyone. bang. Well, we used to turn up to places like uh, youth clubs and stuff. That was oh. another good place. We used to... Um, Ambush that shit, right? <laughs> Beatboxing is so impactful like that, right? Buses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like me and Merlin, like a little bit oh, later big on. Big up Merlin, hold yeah. tight. Me and, because we were partners, yeah. you know. Um, we, were, we were known as Total Control Rappers, mm -hmm. TCR. And it was me, Merlin and Kenny, but Kenny didn't really hang around, whereas me and Merlin kind of carried on uh, for a couple of years. And we used to go and do a lot of battling and whatever. We used to just turn up and smash every event. Mm. But we used to be like, yo, Merlin. Yeah, but obviously we used to call him Justin because we knew his name. He's like, yo, Justin, what, what bus are you on? And he's like, yo, I'll look out the window. So we wait there. He's going past <laughs> and I see him on the bus. We jump on. Next minute, we're having a party on the you bus. You see what this is about? Yo, in 2022, 2023, they ain't having any of that. <laughs> yo, can you imagine having fun? Who would ever get that? Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. yeah, there was an incubation period where if you were a creative within those restrictions, here comes a creative part, you get known. They couldn't, listen, if, if you were creative... There wasn't this so-called China rule I was talking about mm. to stop you. So you'll now break through. You just break through. You just if you got the drive, you'll go there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whereas, whereas now it's like everything you do, like if you put a full stop in the wrong place, you're wondering if you're gonna get banned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. So, do you understand? So it's like there's so he, many things. She, things like that. I was, I was, yeah. I was telling someone about. I was telling someone this morning on the way up here. Um, not, yeah, I was off to Wembley to do something. But on the way up to Wembley, I was talking to someone on the train and I was saying how I got banned from Facebook because mm. I, I used the word kidnap. And he goes, mm. you're an idiot. Why would you use that knowing you run a channel? And I'm like, but look at the context I put it in. And he goes, yeah, but it's algorithms. It's not people. They're not seeing this. And I'm like, yeah, but... You know what I mean? Then they, they need to change the algorithms. Are you an antagonist, Blade? Do you, do you find that... The these, these kind of convert because this is a, like I always see these videos of like I've been banned again. Do, oh. do, 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 do you get do you, do you ever find like yourself in a social situation where you just say something like that and it's just like yo, bro, I didn't mean it like that, bro. I didn't mean it like that. Do you yeah, get that? Yeah, of course. Uh, look, it's it's. <laughs> I guess it's being you know like before before we knew what autism was, yeah, or before we knew what Tourette's was, yeah. or before any of these things. Right? Do you know how many times I've had to jump in and stop people beating up my friend who had Tourette's? Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because he was going, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. That's the coolest son of a beatbox out there. That don't yeah, kill it. But, but that's what yeah. he was doing, you know? And like, But when we got to understand that, look, there's Tourette's, they don't mean it. It's, but this is what it's like. It's like how many people were wanting to beat this guy up and it's almost like Facebook mm. wants to beat all us up because we got that momentary Tourette's and going, yeah, we kidnap yeah. people. Do you reckon? <laughs> I think some people. I think nowadays, though, more than ever, uh, there is a self awareness, a community community self awareness of understanding those conditions like Tourette's. Um, yeah, uh, being on the spectrum and such. I think people can accept that. I find it really bizarre because you you come from a cloth that's cut of an era where you say what the fuck is the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I was just thinking that. How is it that people can handle conditions but can't actually face their, their own mirrors? That's quite hard, isn't it? You know what? Um, I've, I mean, I've always said it, and it got to a point in my life where I just thought, I'm not going to watch anyone else. Yeah, I'm not going to do it no more. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not doing it. But then I see a lot of people that basically are great artists, but don't have a clue how to go out there and present themselves. Well, this is where 521 comes from. And right? that's what that's why I wanted to set up 521. We're definitely gonna get into that. For your for your time, and you got into the in, the MC career of Blade from those early adopting um uh, 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 aspects of hip hop. Then I mean I remember, and this is where I come into the fold as a as a fan. Um London Posse holds true. Um, then the Caliphs, 
scientists of sound come around, brotherhood come around, you still maintain... And we're talking about like an era of hip-hop now where the, the commerciality happens through MTV. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and these, these, these artists that are aforementioned here, they, they managed to... Uh, what were the other ones as well? There was a bunch of others. And some of them actually made it onto a London um, Yo! MTV Raps episode, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. These were... And, and I think London Posse was definitely... Yeah, yeah. In effect, yeah. Uh, yeah, you st still underground carried through as almost like the equivocal of them, but on a more like you say working man's that 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 the guttural version of. Mm. How was that managing that era of of, of UK hip hop? You know, I think there was a respect amongst artists um, where if someone was good, you just basically. Um, kind of left them in their lane, got on with what you were doing, and you weren't trying to step on anyone's toes. Yeah. You were just getting on with what you were You're doing. You were just getting on with it, yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and it, you know, that I learned a lot in my early days, um, just, just from little things like football, um, realising that, okay, you know what, I might be good enough to dribble and take on a whole team and score, but it's a lot easier mm. if you pass and then you run mm. up and wait for that ball to come to your head mm. and... Uh, then, you know what I mean, if you got a shotgun, you can shoot the goalie before you shoot. <laughs> okay, that's uh, it, yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, um, know your position. Know, know your position and, and work that position. I mean, you basically, you have to look at it like you got 90 minutes to play this game. 90 minutes is not a lot to ask to say, just focus for 90 minutes. Mm. You know, and it's the same with when you're recording. Like, you know, you're in the recording studio for this time. Why are you coming into the recording studio all lazy and uh, don't mm. feel like doing it? And I don't know if we'd booked it yesterday when I was feeling a bit more mm. upty. Mm -hmm. And it's like you're here. Focus is real, isn't it? Because yeah. even nowadays, it's hard to maintain that focus. I suffer from it. I think we all do. There's a, as we've mentioned before, there's a culture for it nowadays. But to hold court and double down on that niche the way you did. You know, this is way beyond, you know, the brick core noise. This is this now you're, and and I think this will get, is what gave you wings to, be be. Uh, would I would I be right in saying headhunted for the Mark B and Blade album? Yeah, it's an I interesting mean, time because Vadim was part of the mix as well. That he kind of, he was a massive fan of you, and then you you then did a couple of features with him, right? Uh, well, I did a feature with Vadim. That's it. Um, but if I'm being honest, I didn't really like what he delivered as the feature. Um, You're very particular about your beats, aren't you? Well, no, I'll tell you, and I'll say it openly. What I didn't really like is I get a call from Mark B basically oh. saying, um, I get a call from Mark B basically saying, yo, um, you know Vadim's changed the beats. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, the track you've done, Vadim's changed the beats. He's changed the whole instrumental, even the hi-hat. He, he had a notoriety of doing that, and, didn't he? Uh, and I and I said to him, and I called him and I said, bro, when were you gonna No, I saw him at an event and I, I and I said to him, when were you gonna tell me you changed the track? And he goes, Well, it's my album. And I'm like, it's my vocals. I wrote my vocals based around something else. And I've heard the track that you've done, and it's shit. You've completely Yo, you taken told, it out of context. You really served it. You served uh, that up? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Vadim, you know that was spoken about, yeah. Because I didn't really rate what you'd done. And then and then when you did that bit where it was like, he's a... You were supposed to do a scratch, and he's a. You're supposed to do something. This, this is, is like this, he's a. This, this is where that. Gaps. This is where that speaking honestly bit comes in. <laughs> oh, bro. You know what? This like, I've never spoken about this. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And for a long time, I disliked Vadim for that. But then I grew up and thought, you know what? It's done. You know, I got time for Vadim. Vadim's not a bad guy. He just mm. made a mistake. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But it he was, kind of it was walked. A the thing is with Vadim, and I love him as a fucking brother. He put me on, um, and you can check out his podcast as well because I think we 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 indulge a bit in in this whole album period of his. Um, he's he was so hard headed. He and and as much as he was part of the hip hop scene, he kind of walked in like brazen, like. Well, I'm going to do it like this. Click, 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 and it's like, yo, no, no. There's some, there's some moral codes that you don't just go and do. And he was just like treading on all those moral codes. And, and, and the thing is, if he'd done it to the wrong person, mm. he would have got beat up. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because it was that time, it was that era. It was, it was that time. He would have got beat up. Do you know what I mean? And and I'm sure, like, you know, he's come pretty close to it with certain people. Mm. You know, but look, the thing is, when you when you invite someone else to be on your record, have the common courtesy to send them a finished copy to reference and say they're happy with. 
especially when you're changing the beats and the, the everything, basically. Mm. I mean, I, I did everything I could to, you know, make sure that you were given enough props in the lyrics and all that kind of stuff. And all you had to do was just add the little scratch bits in and mix it and it mm. was done. Mm. But no, you went and changed the entire instrumental to, to be something completely that I didn't agree. I never even heard until it got on vinyl. It's getting a bit spicy, this one, ain't it? Son? No, but it's, it's, it's true, though. <laughs> like, yeah, you, yeah. You know, it's true. I mean, would you would you want someone doing that to yours? I find it. I find it. Um, I find it challenging. But I also think to myself, well, hmm. and you have to yeah. remember, it was at a time when I had actually taken a sabbatical for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was trying to come in strong, and I didn't need these little hiccups. These mm. little, like, you know, man, it's like if I'm going to put my name to something. I mean, you know, I did the track with Vadim yeah, because Mark asked me to. So Vadim's were you working friend. with Mark? Were you working with Mark before that feature? Yeah, um, I believe I was. Because, um, I mean, Mark wanted to work with me for many years before, but I just oh. kept telling him I wasn't really feeling the production and stuff. So uh, eventually I ended up sitting down with him, um, picking loops and all kinds of stuff, and then we, we kind of you know, uh, built our way of working. Mm. Um, and then Vadim got into the equation after and Vadim asked me to do the track with him or Mark said Vadim wanted to do a track and I said, yeah, cool. Uh, but basically because it was Mark's thing. And at this mean? point, rest in peace, Mark B. For those of you who don't know about this gentleman, I mean, you know, serial break finder. He's just a really beast and the beats for... For want of a better description, when we're talking like that whole crew, actually, you know, um, what were they called? Creators. Creators. And then there was Vadim, the whole K Bora thing, the Jazz Fudge thing. It all kind of was a big old clusterfuck of like just energy. And Mark B was certainly uh, mm. instrumental in that sound, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're saying that you created almost like a, uh, a sound library mm -hmm. of, of components that then went on to build what I would only describe as a seminal moment in UK hip-hop mm -hmm. history. I, I, I can't think of any I other... I mean, me and Mark were on the phone like four, five, six hours a day just playing loops and going, nah, not that one, use this one. Nah, don't take on the it phone? From there. Yeah, wow. on the phone, because he was in Kingston uh, or Barnes mm. and I was in, in, um, in New Cross. Mm. Yeah. Um, and and it, was, it was like... He would he would sample something that I'd kind of go I right, pick that out and he'd sample that and I'd be like nah don't take it from the the bass drum like because on the bass drum it's got the end of the last word from the other one and it kind of clips and it sounds off yeah. although sometimes if you pick a trumpet or something it sounds good yeah 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 yeah, yeah so you're kind of like all right you Mark the reason I don't like the production is basically because you're doing it as a you're doing it as a beat maker. Right, you're not thinking about what the rapper needs to do. You're on not it. thinking like a producer, a conventional producer. Right, right. right. And 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 um, you know, it took a lot of work to. Uh, I mean, we were talking for a good, good couple of years before we got to that point. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He sent me so many tracks, and I was just like, nah, nah, mm. nah. Um, but then occasionally it'd be something, and and uh, I, I remember using this word all the time with him: clinical. Mark, sometimes when you do your beats and the way the hi hat is so strategically. Do you know what I mean? It's like there's no life to it. There's mm. no soul to it. Right. You know, it sounds to me like I'm in a hospital on a deathbed waiting for someone to come along and go... <laughs> <laughs> well, just because these the producers, they um, they get super hung up on those little details, don't they? Mm. That's what... And that's by def by design, that's like their extreme. That's their, like, extreme, you know... Um, What's his name from the Beach Boys? What's his name? I forget his name. Fucking, I, I, you know I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Where they, you can imagine they're just like, you know, the blinds are down and they're just in there in a dusty room just figure. And all they did, they get so attached to that one snare or that one mm. iron. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? When, you know, the majority of like, the DJ premieres and the Pharrells of the world, they... It's just what sounds right. Yeah. You know, you don't need to get so deep with it. Like, just make it sound right. And then after that, it's just about EQing things correctly mm. and, uh, and making it sound like it's polished and then it's in the hands of the gods after that, okay. isn't it? Well, it's in the hands of the the listener and the, the yeah, the, the label. And we were literally just walking up the road, oh, undisclosed location, I might add, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm about to tell you our whereabouts. We'll have a swarm outside the fucking studio. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there was a, a moment where I was like, oh, yo, 
Benny G lived around here, right. which is obviously like the place where uh, your, he was your DJ for a good period of time. Yeah, yeah. And we, uh, we've done a few tours with him. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's brilliant. You um, toured yeah. the fuck out of that album. Yeah. I remember seeing you at some... I remember hosting and beatboxing and you'd call me up and be like, yo, do you want to come and do the L- London Astoria, which was the <laughs> which was the then London legendary London Astoria. And mean I was fiddly, just... Yeah. yeah, mean fiddle the whole time. I was blown away. Whole time. <laughs> yeah. My God. I remember coming around to your house and you were like, yo, I'm... Keller, look, you're really good at this beatbox thing. And you something that still sticks with me now. You turned around to me and you were like, there will always be another better beatboxer out there. So make sure you get your shops up. Because I guess as a beatboxer, you were looking at me going, yeah, he's really good. So what it meant was there's going to be someone else. And there's going to be someone. And lo and behold, guess what happened? There's fucking loads of them out yeah. there now. Yeah. But I actually remember that conversation. Because yeah, yeah. should we tell the story? Yeah, let's or, tell or the should story. we leave it for another interview? We'll, uh, we'll leave it for your interview. Let's leave it for your interview. Because I'll tell you what, we, this is the first of, of two pieces, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're doing the 521 as well. So yeah, we'll get into that there. Let's stick with you. Okay, because okay. I think what's really important is that people understand the gravity of that album. Mm. And as much as it was painstaking, and I get, I would imagine, you know, you, you and Mark were very two different people, but you needed to have been to create the friction that made the album. That's mm. part of the course, right? Mm. That must have been a real seminal moment for your your career as well, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, at the time when when this was all going on, I was going through a lot of shit. Um, some I can talk about, some I can't talk about. Um, I mean, I can talk about it, but you know, what I mean, it's like you grow up and you just decide it's time to leave certain things behind and mm. never mention them again. Um, but when, when the album was going on, um, a certain situation caused me to be homeless. And I ended up living in the basement of an equipment shop where there was no shower, no bath. The, the sink was no wider than that bottle of water. What? Um, that's that's as, as big as it was. That's a, a small bottle. Of uh, it was literally, water, yeah. you could literally put your hand into the sink and wow. your hand would be in the full sink. Um, so, you know, obviously I had my toothpaste and toothbrush. Um, no, I wasn't allowed any furniture. Um, and, and yeah, I remember those days really, really well. And like, I, I wasn't allowed any furnishings of any sort. So I could have an office chair in there because it was like a, a an office kind of situation. Wow. But anything that made it look like there was someone living there was going to be a problem for Michael, who owned the equipment shop, who was helping me out. Of course. Right, you were so, just doing your solid, giving your place yeah, to stay. Well, I was there for eight months. Eight months? Eight months. Hold on. So this is like some really bad Clark Kent and Superman. So you would be like in this position. You knew you had a label that was running in some money to get the thing paid for and you guys off on tour. You'd go on tour. You'd be a superstar on stage. You'd come back off and you're back down there in a in the office. Yeah. Yeah, that is fucking And And on the weekends hard. I'd go in, and on the weekends I'd be um, staying at my girlfriend's house. Mm. Um, you know, obviously to go and see my son and everything as well. Mm. So that's when I used to get my showers and stuff. You know, what a shit show, man. I, I mean, Fucking but there was times hard. when there was times as well when you know, I, I just on the off chance, I'd be like, you know what, uh, I can jump the bus, whatever, I can get there, mm. and um, I'd, I'd end up there in, in midweek. You know, so but it was it was um, it was I still remember like coming out of the. Uh, the back entrance because I wasn't allowed to leave from the front entrance oh, ever. God, I had to come out the back entrance and it was all druggies just behind that building uh, on a, on this estate in New Cross and you they're all out there. Oh, New Cross was a beast back yeah. there as well, boy. And um, but I had my studio equipment there, so I just used to sit there and you know I set my equipment up and I was still recording. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was able to record, but I I couldn't live. You know, and I remember waking up in the mornings because I wasn't allowed any blankets or anything. So Because it couldn't look like you lived no. there. So I used to sleep on the floor. I used to sleep on the floor. Um, and I used to wake up in the morning sometimes with mice and rats running over Oh, me. fuck that. <laughs> fuck that. Darling, you tell me that has happened to you. That doesn't. Um, Shit. You know, but it's, it's crazy. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't all the time. It's just one or two times it happened. I'm like, fuck it. I need it once, bro. You only need it once. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it once. Oh, no, it happened more that. than once. It definitely happened more than once. You know what I mean? And um and and the mad thing is, it's like I'm walking down the street and people are going, "Yo, they're playing. You don't see the signs on the radio. Yeah. Oh my god, it's blowing!" And I'm there thinking, yeah. 
I ain't got money to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the wrong side of success, yeah. isn't it? It's but like o- you've got to le- you've got to keep it moving to get those residuals. Yeah, but also you you have to remember that it was Mark B that was signed. I wasn't signed, so Mark was signed, not me. Uh, my signing did came... that create the fr- did that create a level of friction? No, not not for me because. Uh, I just wanted to... Because you knew the uh, rules. You uh, knew what it was. Uh, listen, I, I was like, I just need this as a stepping stone to going where I'm going. Mm. And it was when I did my next album yeah. where I made proper money. Yeah. But when I say... Sorry, when I got proper sales, but the distributor went bankrupt and didn't pay me. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I started seeing like all these sales. I mean, no one else is going to know other than the people that came to the shows and stood in those queues and know they had to wait long to get to the front. Mm. Yeah, because those queues were long. People were standing in the queues for like half an hour, hour, mm. Mm. you know what I mean? Just to come there and go, yo, can you sign my trainers? I'll, I'll buy two copies of the album and, you know. Again, going was back to the loyal fan base, the hardcore straight, fan. Like, so we went from going from the charts into going back to uh, street level. And um, if I'm if I'm being honest... The, the getting into the charts and doing the unknown was good for my profile, but financially, it was shit. Um, financially, I was I was a lot better off doing the stuff I was doing. Mm. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah, it got me a deposit for a house, but I didn't see anything after that. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's a fable. It's an age-old scenario, isn't it, unfortunately? And, and I think everyone that's walked through that... that, that Period of music, which you've got to bear in mind, we, we, we're talking like vinyl was still being sold, but in the meantime, social media had suddenly popped out of nowhere. And I don't mean like social platforms, it was the internet era, or LimeWire, and all these other places. People were just like ripping the shit out of stuff. So you only had your live gigs to support you. Yeah. And if you ain't careful, your money's going to go down a drain. I don't know how half them people bought big swaggy like MGs and you know sports cars well, for its time. That's crazy. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of a lot of them was on credit, innit? Yeah. So and you had to get them back as well. Yeah, that. and you know when you buy a lot of things on credit, it, it just creates more problems, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does um, indeed. But if the the law in the country, I believe, is that if um, if you haven't paid it back within six years, they can't trace you anymore. Yeah. So whoever okay. owe, whoever you owe. You got six years, and if they haven't come to you within six years and collected, so you just need to dodge people for six years. Moving forward, let me twenty pounds. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm going to ignore oh, you for six years. Yo, I, I ain't do bullshit either. I'm not going to tell you the shop. But the other day they gave me an old ten pound note, and I didn't blink twice as soon as I opened the uh, the wallet. I was like, that's an old fucking ten pound man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the luck of the uh, luck of the draw, yeah. isn't it? You know, can I can I just say on the subject of what I was saying about where I was living and all that do as it. well? Like the thing is, no one really knew. Even my girlfriend didn't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, you kept it way on the low. Well, it was embarrassing, bro. It's like people are coming to you and saying they... I mean, there was there was one person who knew, um, my friend Julian. I mean, he knew that. And obviously Michael, who owned the shop, knew. Mm. But it was embarrassing. You mm. know? And I wasn't comfortable talking about it back then. So all of these people, like even, even the, um, my manager, Jason, um, you know, he came on the scene when we started making a bit of noise with the unknown... And, and then mm. he was talking like deals. So he came a little bit later. Mm. So he didn't even know all this stuff. Mm. You know, but I mean, how do you go around telling people, yeah, my records are, you know, you're oh, going yeah, up totally to people, did. you're, you're going up to people and people are like, yo, you fucking hell, it's like you're blowing up. And, yeah, and yeah. I'm there going, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then I'm, I'm going past and I'm seeing rats crawling on bins. But I hear the same story from like Motorhead documentaries and Kurt Cobain. Like all these people, they, they went through the same thing. It's a very similar similar um, direction that's what happens to these people this the, this illusion even now you know what I mean like people have this thought that okay well if you're if the attention on you is escalating then surely there must be you must be super successful mm. because you've got all this attention and it's like yeah no the, the attention is pretty much the that's the that's the uh, you know on uh, David Attenborough Bird um, documentaries, yeah. they're kind of moving their feathers yeah, yeah. in the, in the you know, the, the rainforest. These birds are like full on regalia and luminous colours, but that's just showmanship. Mm. It's not, it's not, when you look behind the curtain, it ain't really that. No, it's not, it's not, yeah. you know, and, and there is a lot of smoke and mirrors and, you know, men. So, yeah, it's, uh, I wish I could, I wish I kept the diary where I kept a lot of notes in. 
because um, there was a time when I was, and I only threw it away a couple of years ago because I was looking through it and, bro, it was the most depressing reading ever. Really? I Just waking up with things like, when's this going to change? Why am I all over the radio, but I'm still not able to buy a, a loaf of bread? Is this why, mm. is this why, um, and just throwing it to the here and now, actually, to be fair, because there's a lot going on with you with the 521. Uh-huh. And everything that, uh, this is the sentiment that I get, get from it, right? Because I, especially when someone like Chester P comes on board and uh, the, the, the hand is raised out to, to draw support. And also the other artists, the, 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 the temperature in which you bring these artists in, at a time in which you bring these artists in and giving the opportunity for newer than new acts that come from the, the genre, the, the double down of this lane and what you've created here. Does that hark back to the uh, those experiences, you know, from the diaries to the to the hustling to the you've got a, you've got a real um, good gauge on on the the working classness of it all because that's what artistry is. It doesn't it, some people never make it over that threshold. Uh, you make it really easy for people to gain exposure in whatever they're going through. I mean, I mean, okay, um, it's. It's a little at the moment, but I feel I got so much planned, mm. and my aim I'm not going to be satisfied till I can change some lives. Mm. And by changing one or two lives, I'm hoping that those people will then go on to change other people's lives. Um, so, you know, I I want to save people twenty years of misery. Mm. Yeah, because mm. like like I said, like there's so many people that come to me and they've got like videos and they've got these tracks and they do the video and they think that that's it the beginning and end and it's not there's so much more that's like five percent if if that Mm. you know and i don't know all the answers because i've only been successful on certain levels i haven't had jay-z success Mm. but i've had dilated people success Mm -hmm. do you get what i'm saying Mm -hmm. so but i feel one of the things that really grates on me is when I watch people talking on podcasts and stuff and they they are artists who haven't had any success at all. They're still underground. They've got very little followings. Uh, no one's showing any interest, but yet they're doing podcasts telling people how to be successful. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying. And, and I'm not trying to tell people how to be successful. What I'm trying to do with my podcasts, it's not even a podcast, it's a channel. Um, you it's like do a, a TV podcast. Show. No, yeah, it's that's like what a TV I'm, show. And I'm trying to do something bigger than that. Um, you know, and what what I see with a lot of people is like they have their direction and they, they're going their route. I'm going my route. My route isn't about me. The number of people, and, and they will all verify this. Everyone that's come through the channel. Comment below. You I, know the deal? Not, you know, they... I've had people coming in there and going, yeah, big up Blade. And, and I'm like, bro, can we do that again? Don't mention Blade. Mm. Mention 521 if you have to mention something. But ideally mention you, your crew. And if you can mention 521, great. Yeah, because this ain't about Blade. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I've, I've had my little flirtation period with the music industry and stuff. Mm. And I feel that... I've got a certain level of knowledge and understanding in particular to do with the independent thing because I was doing it before anyone. Mm. And I feel like I can educate people on certain things. But I always tell people, listen, what worked for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, because... You, but it's about having, giving them the parameters in which they know what to... Ex- you're, but, a but conduit, of, you're a conduit. That's but on top of that, it's like... Do you know how many times I've met people and I, I tell people, you'll never meet anyone like me again? Oh, yeah, I can vouch for that, bro. <laughs> yeah, 100%. No, because, because my energy was different. Yeah. You know, I was meeting people from New York, like coming up to me and talking to me, like when they were in London, and they're going, you don't belong here. You need to be in New York. Your energy is just yeah, a yeah, whole yeah. different No, level. no, you are. You've got a, bro. Uh, I yo, mean, he, so, whoever told you that is true. Right. You've got a New Yorkian in mentality. <laughs> You're like, yo, fucking let's go. What the fuck's wrong with you, man? Yeah. Like, honestly, you could be that guy. You would be the hustler in New York. It's the same mentality. Yeah, and and, you know, like... And, and don't get me wrong, you wake up a lot of mornings deflated because you feel like you're giving everyone... like it's, it's, You feel like here's, here's the whole of the music community and you're giving people the answers and they're still getting it wrong. 
Do you understand? And it's like I'm waiting for that moment when they all click and realize, you know what? It's like I see what he's doing now. Mm. Just time in it. I'll give you an example. Let me grab this. All right. All right, so if you're not, not I'm, I'm not going to obviously I'm not going to be listening. able to show it, but I'm going to show you. Yeah. Okay. So what we've so, got here is we've got the phone. He's dialing in on no, something. No, I'm not. I'm not dialing in on anything. Like this is an artist. Okay. So we're that at. I asked. So we're on the Instagram two years, page. When yeah. I started the channel, he's a young artist. Can I say I his him, name? No, don't don't say okay. the name, but just read what okay. what he said. Uh, can I read it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So on the DM here it says, "Good to see how well you're doing, bro. Your vision is, I guess, it's on point." It's a dartboard with the... It's a dartboard emoji. Okay. Now, yeah. this is a guy I tried to get on the channel a year and a half ago. Right. Right? And the point I'm making is it's like the number of times I got blown out <laughs> <laughs> because mm-hmm. he had stuff going on, which is cool. I understand it. But he wasn't getting the vision back then when I was telling him what I was trying to do. Mm. And now he's... I said, one day you'll wake up and you'll see what I'm trying to do. The penny drops, yeah. And I think it's dropped. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like... He's realizing now that, okay, I see what he was trying to do. Because mm. he wanted me to go to them. And I'm like, nah, it's about the branding. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, I have to, like, you know, if you're if you're in England, nothing should be stopping you from going wherever you need to go to promote yourself, even if it's to another five people. Mm, super important. And, and you know what I find also entertaining is there's a lot of people, and you'll get this, there's a lot of people that they, they won't travel half an hour mm. to get to where you are an hour mm. yeah but <laughs> and and to get themselves on a channel where the growth the numbers the views are always going to grow mm. like people are always going to stumble Evergreen. across it yeah yeah and it's always going to grow however they'll go all the way to Timbuktu to do a show for to six do a people gig. yeah yeah do, do totally totally I get you what is wrong with you lot on balance it's super important to spread just if, especially if you're starting out like it's just learn to say yes learn to say yes to absolutely everything go 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 but that's that old mentality we're talking about mm-hmm. like do you know what i mean it's, someone asked me the other day how did you buy a house from like they came to my house yeah um and and they were like how did you how did you buy a house from from music and i said um i did a lot of things for nothing mm-hmm. and they're like so if you did them for nothing, mm. where'd you get the money from? Mm. I'm like, do you do you understand what it's like building ten years of favors yeah. up, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then to all all of a sudden call on all of those people and go, I need those favors all within the next six months. It's its own currency, bro. Yeah, it's its own currency. I am. Um, I I had a, the luxury of being with DJ Switch. Um, not the not the D, not the DMC guy, but the guy oh, okay. behind um, Major Laser. A okay. lot of the Major okay. Laser stuff. Uh, and I was around his house and. You know, he was an, a huge advocate of just giving away his tunes for free. And I, at the time, when I was with him, I was like, yeah, it's crazy because he's got this big house, you know, four or five different laptops. And I'm like, yeah, how's he doing it if he's just giving away tunes? And he goes, give them away, give them away, give them away. Then the following like month, I see that Beyonce picked up the Major Lazer song and now has it's We Run the World Girls. You know what I mean? It's like, he was right. He was right. It's, it's, it's having that belief in yourself, though, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you got to believe in yourself in order to... Like be able to let go of things. Mm. Like you got you got a, a couple of choices: leave everything on your hard drive because no one's giving you money for it, <laughs> or give it to somebody mm. and and see what it does. But being precious doesn't serve anything. It does doesn't. It? it doesn't. Is that no. something that you're constantly encouraging people on your channel? And you know, I, I can imagine you can probably prescribe things to people just on first introduction based on. Their, their mannerisms, their rapping skills, their branding. I'm sh- pretty sure you're, a lot of your day, it's the, it's, it's the, the heavy is the weight, the crown on the head. <laughs> yeah. Look, you know what? Um, everyone that's come through the channel has been, has been amazing. We, we've had a couple of little hiccups where I'm not going to mention the group's name. Um, I was talking to them because I'm going to get them back in. And, um, and I said to them, the first time you came around, you were all so high and drunk mm-hmm. that, like, you know, we struggled to get the footage for the performance, mm-hmm. but we did it. But the interview is a no go. <laughs> oh, shit. Right? It's like, it can't oh. happen. So, anyway, I called Tough them. Crowd, and I, man. <laughs> anyway, I called them and I said, We're going to, uh, we, you know, I want to get you back. Yeah. But this time I've got a set of rules. You're not going to come in intoxicated, no drink, no drugs. You're not going to go to the corner shop to buy drinks. 
Um, do all of that when you've done the job. Mm. Yeah, but mm. while you're doing the job, come in here, Behave. be sober. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> but, but it was so funny because when when we were looking at the interview footage, I mean they were smoking so much that you could barely see the logo in the distance. <laughs> they had no eyes. It was just yeah, really, it was all smoked yeah, the fuck yeah, out. It was smoked out. It's so funny. Do you see so, hip hop? But when I one point zero like <laughs> fucking. But when when I when I explained that to him. He was like, uh, you know, is this bad? I kind of feel proud of that. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> and I was like, bro, I find it entertaining. But You know, you know that would be on like the best of like the <laughs> 521 moments. Oh, just... We deleted it, man. Yeah, we were just dude. like, I don't want to, I don't want to keep stuff that's just going to basically create more work. <laughs> uh, do you know what I mean? Well, this shit's labor intensive, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, and more power to you for doing it, man. Yeah. Like, I think it's a super important um, platform that, that deserves as much, yeah. Thanks, as much man. light and, as possible. And same, and same for you, like, you yeah. know, and the thing is, like we're all serving a different purpose. Mm. Like you know, my my vision is different to your vision. All City Steve was doing a great job. Oh as yeah, well. big up All City Steve as well. You know, he's, sure. he's doing that a cab, great job. That cab concept uh, is sick in it. Yo, I remember when I first saw it, I was like, yo, that is such a fucking hard idea. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, the, the thing is, I've had some other people that I've seen saying, oh yeah, I was doing the cab concept. Like, uh, and and I'm thinking, nah. There was no one before Steve. No, there wasn't. There no. wasn't. I can't see it. But I then, can't see but it. then I saw something with uh, who was who was the girl in um, So Solid? Lisa Mafia. Lisa Mafia. Mm. Big up, Lisa. She, I think I think Lisa Mafia did something in a cab, but I mm. don't think it was before All City Steve. Mm. Oh, you know, uh, quite so. possibly. Oh, who knows? There's a couple of things going on. I mean, you know, concepts and brandings and things like that. It's just about staying on top of them, isn't it? Mm. You know. I mean, but I but because good. of the pandemic, you know, he had to change his ammo a little yeah, bit yeah. and whatever. But he's got a sick new cab now, mm. and um, yeah, yeah well, he's I'm, on he's on the new cab look now. Yeah. Have you seen it? I saw. I think which one did I see? I saw the um, Brim, the uh, Tats Crew. Okay. One. Yeah, yeah. But the, I think that was via internet. No, or? no, he was in. He oh, was he was in, in the cab. It, yeah. well, I haven't yeah, seen yeah. it yet. I haven't yeah, seen that not. yet. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna catch it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, the cab is sick, bro. Yeah. Like it's it's proper, man. It's That's like, good. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if he paid nearly a hundred grand for that. Yeah, well, you know but it's because he knows where it's going. That's going to be doing loop the loop round loads of different corners. <laughs> to get the, I want I often think to myself, yeah, man, like where does he take these people? You know what I mean? Like well, how far does he have to go and drive? Well, no, normally, from <laughs> from what I understand, normally, um, I I don't know because when when I when I did my interview with him, I said to him, bro, can we do it different? He's like, how? I was like, well, how about we go location to location and we actually stand outside the places where I feel history was made. Nice. So that's that's what we did. That's hard. You know, so um, he was like, all right, where do we go? So I was like, all right, you know, while we're here, let's go to that phone box where I found like two grand in a, in a, in a wallet. And I called a guy and gave him his money back. And Yo, that's sick. You know what? So for reference points of... The geographical timeline of Blade, definitely check out All City Steve and also check out 521. Mm. We need a part two. The part yep, two yep. is upon us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm S looking forward to that. Get um, it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make that happen. Yeah, I'll make give that me, happen. Give me, a, give me a time frame and... Yeah, it's on like just, Donkey Kong. Yeah, I'm trying to, if you notice, I'm trying not to look too far into that camera because I don't know how my dodgy <laughs> eye is looking. It's all right, <laughs> the, the audio speaks for itself, man. Blade... <laughs> Legend, we thank could, you so much for passing lot, through, my yeah. brother. Hope we got everything out that we needed to. We're setting precedents right here. Big shout out to all the other channels doing their thing. You know who you are. Killer Kel podcast. Out like it was out of fashion. Don't speak to anyone. Or I wouldn't. All right. You stay lucky. Sharing is caring and all that business. All right. Do not sleep. I repeat, do not sleep on it. Thanks so much, Blade. Wicked. My brother. Thanks a lot, bro. Hold tight. Peace.